Hello guys, I'm Philip Magnus and this is Tyranny, Obsidian Entertainment's latest isometric role-playing game. Following amidst the footsteps of Pillars of Eternity, this is going to be an epic tale telling the story of you, a high-ranking minion of a villain who has basically taken over the world. Yes, you are actually pretty much playing as a minion of Sauron, so to say, so to speak. There are four difficulties, we're going to go with the normal one, because I'm not all that good with this kind of game. So without further ado, let us see what's in store for us. Use the spacebar to pause and unpause the game during combat to issue orders to your party members and evaluate your strategy. Yum. Delicious. Absolutely delicious. Huh. Ah, there we go. For over 400 years, the armies of Kairos the Overlord have swept across the known world. All who stood against them fell before their might. Even the Archons, women and men of immense power, were forced to kneel, chained to the Overlord's will. Now Kairos' final conquest has come to our corner of the world, and two of the Overlord's armies compete for the honor of taking our lands. The elite disfavored, and the teeming horde of the Scarlet Chorus. The voices of Narad, spymaster and archon of secrets, guides the fierce and undisciplined masses of the Scarlet Chorus. With each battle, the Scarlet Chorus grows stronger as the defeated are given a simple choice. Serve or die. Grave and Ash, Archon of War and the Overlord's most loyal general, leads the disfavored. Though small in number, Kairos's ironclad legion has never met true defeat in open battle. Watching over the two generals is Tunan, the Adjudicator, Archon of Justice, eldest of Kairos's minions. Tunan brings Kairos's laws to newly conquered lands, aided by the Fatebinders, judges and executioners of the Overlord's laws. You were among the youngest of the court of Fatebinders when Kairos's armies came to our lands. How could we have known? that the fate of thousands would rest in your hands. Well, they are my hands. So what did you expect? Oh, I can be a girl! Or a boy. Huh. Strangely unresponsive. Better, better. Let's see. That is something of an issue. Isn't it? Let's see what exactly the body types are. We've got skinny, even skinnier, and skinny and not too tall. I think I'm going to go with the skinny and tall guy, which frankly shows me in a fairly exact manner. Let's see, in the Northern Empire, where you were born, men enjoy equal protections under the laws of the Overlord Kairos. Oh, Kairos, lovely, lovely, lovely. Oh, I can even right click on the details. A name out of legend, the Overlord has consolidated power for centuries, sending vast armies to swallow entire realms. The most powerful mystic the world has ever seen, Kairos can issue Edicts, magical proclamations that level cities, spread pox, sound the lands, or change the course of seasons. The Archons, the masters of magic throughout the known world, bow to Kairos, and the Overlord readily destroys any Archons unwilling to kneel. These sorceresses and madmen. Oh, madmen. Lead the Overlord's armies in near endless conquest. I mean, I suspect that 
at one point or another the conquest has to end, so it's good that they have that nearly right there. As the realms of the known world fall to the Overlord, these captured territories are divided up amongst the Archons to manage. Management, I love it. Able to deliver suffering and woe to every corner of Teratus, or is it Teratus? Without leaving the capital, few have seen the Overlord in person. Tokaris' name is the single most recognized name in the world. Only the Archons can say what the Overlord looks like. Alright. So, in the certain lands of the tiers, only men may own or captain ships, but real estate is restricted to women. Men may lease, but durable ownership of the land in the tiers always passes to elders, daughters or sisters. Most sons enter their father's profession by their mid-teens, those without a profession or family, lands to work and find purpose by pledging service to one of the overlords mighty archons. Exciting, exciting, exciting. There's more criminals, derelicts and others are uh, often conscripted into the armies of the Archons. If a child cannot forge his own scheme, he will certainly find one in battle. Alright, so I think I'm going to go with white. No offence to all the other colours, they're lovely. Oh, I can get a nice portrait. Let's see. I think we're going to go with white, and oh, so many customization options! Uh, no. No. I love how much more animated and much more detailed this is than Path of, uh, Path of Exile, sorry, and the Pillars of Eternity. I want epic, epic looking... Ooh, that's epic. That's a goatee and no, yeah, maybe, maybe not. Let's find the nice hair. Will this fit? Um, yeah, sure. Actually, I think I'm going to go with the original, the face. Let's see how many, not many, not many at all. Does anyone look like me, do you think? Probably this one, yeah. My nose though. My nose is a bit bigger and more awful. Uh, this looks like my grandfather. Male noble. Let's see that the voice. So hard. Nice. Let's see. I'm injured. Tired. Let's rest. I got oh. it. Well, I think I'm going to go with the male noble. I'm going to play a sorceress person of sorts. Oh, this is on the hand. Awesome. The leg snakes on my legs. Uh, no thanks. A, fl a tree, not a flower. This is a flower. Uh, honestly, I'm not very impressed with... Maybe if I change the colors around a bit. Oh, not bad. This, I think, is more interesting. Let's go maybe with red. Yeah. And something a bit darker. Yeah, I think this is what we'll go with. But just to be sure. Oh. Shall we make a Cthulhu cultist? Yes, we shall. Yes, we shall. Just to check on the other hair colors. Anything that grabs my attention? Maybe black? Nah. I'm gonna go with either grey or white. What's this? No. Nuh -uh. White it is. Definitely white. Let's just check if I can pick anything that's a bit more interesting. No, I don't think so. Short, very short, kind of afro almost. If afro was a lot shorter than it actually is. Let's choose a sub little portrait. Yeah, I think we are going to go with... Nah. Yeah, let's go with this one. Shall we? Can we take something to match? Nothing quite as short as the thing in the portrait, I'm afraid. Which is kind of... kind of sad. 
Do I want to make a grandfather? Nah. Okay, this is the one. This is the thing we are going with. This is cool though. But no, this is what we are going with. Next. How do you join Karas's army? Oh boy. No, soldier, lawbreaker. Let's see. Accused of a crime you most certainly did commit. You stood before Tunin the Adjudicator, Archon of Justice, and argued your case with eloquence and conviction. Impressed by your logic, reason, and confidence, he found you guilty. <laughs> anyway, I may choose this one just for the humor. Let's see. It is rumored that Tunin selects many of his agents from his prisoners. Better to catch the wicked than those versed in such ways. So, just to warn you, I'm going to be taking a lot of time checking all these options out. So, I'm probably going to end up either with War Mage, few have the combination of wits and courage to be accomplished casters and warriors. And those curse with such a combination of talents are invariable invariably pulled from their mundane lives and assigned to the armies of the Archons. Your earliest memories are a painful slog of training, study lecture and exhaustion, all the elements of being groomed for battle. You knew better than to ask what became of your family, nor to question the missives all allegedly penned by their hand that were part of your earliest lessons in reading. When you reached the... Uh, blah, blah, sorry. When you reached adulthood, Tune and the Adjudicator came to the Barak <laughs> and laid claim to your life. Seeing you as too valuable for the crushable of battle, the Archon of Justice deemed your life better spent dedicated to the art of punitive legal remedies. Punitive legal remedies? Is this what the game is about? I love it in that case. They had much to learn in matters of civil discourse. None could deny your bright future as Tunin's next great enforcer. Hmm. Born to noble parents, uh, leadership, spent on letters, history, rhetoric, and other matters of culture and statecraft. Good wealth, creative comforts, and so much more. Accusation of sedition. My parents sent to the court of Tunan, Archon of Justice, to defend the family. The parents were found guilty. Dissolution of the treasonous estate as a punishment. Eloquently pleading your own ignorance and your family's actions, you negotiated your most important deal yet. Immunity from the crimes of your family, for the simple cost of swearing fealty to the Archon himself. Despite the unwitting induction, your education and savvy made you a valuable addition to the Archon's cater of enforcers. Good. That's interesting. I'm gonna go with that. It's also kind of backstabbing, so let's read up on the diplomat. Though they would never tell you why, Karas bestowed great wealth upon your family for you some unmentioned service, and your parents used this wealth to have you raised far from home. Your childhood was a nomadic tour of Teletus, which hired tutors and fleeting friendships. Where others had stability and routine, you had a worldly and var varied education. A careless word in a far-flung city landed you in legal trouble, and you were taken before Tunan the Adjudicator and made to stand trial. Not only did you plead your innocence, but you turned the accusations around on the accuser for wasting the court's time, and the Archon of Justice concurred, amused by your wit, wisdom, and adaptability. Tunan claimed you as his newest enforcer. Let's finish in his mercy, Tunan offered you the choice of two sentences. Cool. Hmm. This is a difficult choice, and the first of many, but let's go with the noble scion. Sounds the most like me, honestly. Backstabbing and evil. Hmm. Interesting. Let's see. Primary expertise is one of Tunan's fate binders. You receive training in the arts of war, the intrigue of magic and the inexhaustible depths of Karas's law. Across the Northern Empire, the education of a Fatebinder is second to none. Those bearing the title are expected to read instructions and understand the economies of the realms in which they operate. Literacy and mathematics skills rarely found on territors are essential skills in the execution of law. 
subtle talents like speechcraft or tactics are honed with time and experience under Tunin's guidance. Very interesting. So I can either pick dual wielding and go absolutely out of my comfort zone, or choose something way more interesting for me and go with atrophy, frost, shock, or so on and so forth. Mage skilled in shock magic can frequently interrupt their enemies, preventing them from executing their abilities. Interesting, frost spells. The frost magic is an offensive skill that focuses on slowing enemies as well as dealing cold damage. Atrophy magic drains the skills and attributes of your enemies, weakening their attacks and making them easier to kill. Interesting. I think I might just go with atrophy. But before that, Vigor, Utility Branch of Magic. No, not my kind of thing. So I think I may go with Frost Spells. Oh, interesting. So... I cannot choose... this? Huh, interesting. Okay, let's go with Frost Bells. Maybe the second part is on the second option. Let's see, Frozen Grasp. Is that what I want? Let's see. Oh, but you look so cool. Child and Explosive Surge of Electrical Energy. These, this is all very interesting, but I think that Frost it is. But honestly, dual wielding. This is my second playthrough, is definitely going to be dual wielding. And just so I'm not totally boring for myself, I'm going to go with Frost, with Shock Spells. Why? Because it's fun. Oh, in this combat style. Let's see. Believing that all of his agents should be well-rounded, Tunin ordered that you receive training in a secondary combat style. Fate binders are often deployed into treacherous circumstances, and one's ability is to adapt to unexpected changes, like sudden violence or illegal entanglement, can represent the difference between life and death. Or in my case, the difference between. Um. Yeah. I'm going with, I'm going with slicing and dicing with dual wielding because I'm awesome. Very cool. Oh, I have to choose an ability now. I see. Did I did I have abilities to choose last time? No. Good. So I am going to go with Slice. Yeah, definitely. Carefully place the target that attempts to open a major artery, leaving the target bleeding. Just like I like my targets. Bleeding and screaming. Though I must admit, I am kind of wondering why the Frost Spells is not the better choice. No, 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 no. I'm doing something exciting and something I haven't done before. Character colors, awesome. Should I be purple? Uh oh, no, 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 no. Better? Oh, lovely. I can actually pick a banner. Let's see, can we pick something interesting? Na 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 nothing. Oh, maybe this. This seems to be... A warning of sorts, don't you think? Let's go with red and... Something darker. Yes, we'll definitely go with that. I wish I could change the color of my cape. Oh well, it is what it is. Enter name. Um, let's go with Magnus. Because why not? Let's see. Oh, I've got points. Lovely. Finesse. Um, so we've got Might, which I imagine isn't very important for me. We've got Quickness, determines how often a character can use their abilities and spells in combat. Reducing cooldown durations. We'll take one, two, three points in that. Let's see what wit gives us. Attribute this the wit's attribute describes a character's mental acuity, their ability to observe their environment and pick up on clues. Which is used to increase spell strength as well as increase the magic defense. Cool. We'll put another three points here. And finesse. 
It describes a character's physical and mental precision. Finesse is used to determine accuracy of attacks and spells, and as well as increasing worn armor's chances to reduce a hit type. Interesting. Let's put one point and a second point. Spell strength, magic defense. Spell ability, cooldown. I think I'm going to keep it as is. Let's see. Magic stuff and dual wielding. Obviously going to be both on a very high note. How many points do I have? Oh, I've got 18 points. I think I need to have a lot of law points. Let's see. Law skill determines a character's ability to decipher information and put together clues from fragments of information. This skill is critical for magic users who wish to learn new runes to power their spells. Lore is also used in dialogue to determine what you know about the history of the world, or to impress others with your intelligence. That's all pretty basic stuff. Magic skills determines a character's ability to draw and control spells that use the sig sigil of lightning. Her skill values increase the chance of hits and crits. Cool. I'm going to uh, put a few points in there. Let's go up to 40, 30 boat, and let's get 26 in athletics. Athletics determine a character's ability to traverse difficult terrain, as well as their ability to execute complicated moves in combat. Athletics is also used in dialogue to determine your ability to intimidate or physically power overpower someone. So maybe we'll add one, two, three, four. Yep. Let's go onward. Uh -ha. How do you want to continue? Conquest. Selecting the Conquest option will allow you to play through Karas' Conquest of the Tears, choosing how your character was involved in the invasion. This gives you the most control over the starting state of the game and how other factions will react to your character. Oh, we are definitely doing Conquest. I expect that this entire All the world first has fallen to Kairos. And now the Zip. Overlord's eye is on the tears. Our home. The last corner of the world free of Kairos's reign. Two armies. The disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus march south from the Northern Empire. The last realm to fall to Kairos a century prior. Exciting. Let's see. In the early days of 428, Kairos' armies arrive at the Gates of Judgment, the mountainous border that we Tearsmen so long believed unassailable. Unable to agree on a unified plan of defense, the various leaders of the Tears sit and wait for each other to deal with the conquerors. Until it's too late. That sounds like a normal thing for all kinds of politicians. Ah, let's press space to continue. Oh, that that is charming. Conquest. During the conquest, you will decide your character's actions during Kairos' invasion of the tears, shaping the world through which you will adventure over the course of the game. Each choice you make affects your character and how major factions of the tears respond to you. Your decisions matter. Choose wisely. 428 TR. Year one of Kairos' invasion, conquest, and so on. Ho ho ho, I love this. The Bastard City. Uh oh. We have to read this. Bastard City, named for its position between two realms, the Northern Empire and the Southern Tears, the Bastard City and its surrounding lands, known as the Bastard Tier, is a melting pot of culture and a place of commerce and intrigue. The Tears men of the South view the Bastard City as a place of wealth and excess, but to the people of the Northern Empire, the Bastard City is little more than a sprawling slum. Cunan the Adjudicator established his court in the Bastard City. From this foothold in the Tears, he and his court of Fatebinders imposed Karis' laws upon the conquered land. <laughs> Well, anyway, that bastard city stood on the northern border between Karas' empire and the Tears. Built upon a natural arbor, harbor at the crossroads between realms, the city was a nexus of a commerce. Of commerce, to the Tears, it was the center of all wealth. 
To an ordinary, it was little more than a backward trading post. Its symbolic status as a gateway to the continent made it a naturalist, natural first target in Caris's military conquest. Circumstances were ideal for you to prove your worth as a soldier in Caris's armies. Taking the city would send a message to the rest of Te Tears. Caris's will is insurmountable. Oh my. Gates of Judgment. In the first major engagement of the war, Karas' armies crossed the mountains and established a foothold. Both armies sent their forces to prepare the way. Oh my god, this is awesome! I'm choosing the course of history here, just as Trump is probably doing in the White House. Anyway, let's go with the Gates of Judgment, I think. Or rather, no, let's infiltrate the tears. History would remember the Gates of Judgment as the first battle of the conquest, but the real combat unfolded with advanced units of both armies and preparing for the coming war. The Disfavored, which we learned about already in the cinematic at the very beginning, let's not go back to that, and Scarlet Chorus each had a plan to infiltrate the capital city. Which army did you join? Let's see, we can either aid the disfavored scouts, or we can conscript enemy fighters for the Scarlet Chorus. I'm going to go with the disfavored. You lent your skills to the elite disfavored scouts to capture a border garrison. Graven Ash, which is the last of the great northern generals to stand against the Overlord in ages past, Arkan Graven Ash now serves Kairos as supreme commander of the disfavored legion and is charged with conquering the tears. Draven Ash shares a powerful bond with the soldiers under his command and regards each of them as family. The death of a soldier at enemy hands represents a grievous loss to the old general who bears the burden of his love with mournful stoicism. Anyway, he insisted that an early victory in the offensive would boost the morale of his troops and diminish the haughty overconfidence of the Sardiners. Ah, cool sound effect. In the Outerbound, scouts identified the murderous border defense and collaborated on an organized attack that would leave the enemy uncoordinated and cut off from aid. You oversaw the preparations and offered your opinions on the strategy. When the clashing of swords and spears fell to silence, followed by the cheering of disfavored scouts, you were the least surprised of all. Cool. Inside agent, you found an ally within the city to prepare the way for the approaching armies, or containing the fire, the bastard city's resident fire mages threatened the first leg of the conquest. Karas's forces put a stop to their unchecked power. I'm very interested to see how we put a stop to the unchecked power of the fire mages. Let's see. Containing the fire. Your fiercest opponents in the bastard city were the mages of the school of wild wrath. Too barbaric to use their power responsibly. The unbridled practitioners needed to be stopped. How did you trick the hot-tempered mages into their own undoing? Let's see. We can either lure them to a disfavored ambush, or... We can have a meeting with the voices of Nerat. You lured the hot-headed mages to an ambush where a legion of disfavored waited to spring the trap. The soldiers were hungry for a chance to subdue the arcane branch of Tears' resistance. Or you tricked the guild elders into meeting with the voices of Nerat, Archon of Secrets. The Archon was notorious for his cruel and mysterious interrogation techniques. The mages were never seen again. I like the sound of that. You have to be careful with mages and you have to trick them. Because the only thing you can expect from mages, if you don't trick them, is for them to trick you in turn. Anyway, there were few who could describe what horrors the Archon of Secrets visited upon his enemies during the conquest. Whether the elder mages knew little of the Archon's reputation or met with him out of curiosity did not matter. 
Once the flap of the Arkans tent closed, none of them were heard from again, save for a strangled cry of alarm that ended just as swiftly. <laughs> Lead it. Leaderless, the school of wild rat fell into disorder and their remaining members were slain by the dis disfavored or conscripted into the Scarlet Chorus. Betrayal of the Bastard City. Your tactics of inf infiltration placed you in the Bastard City ahead of the main armies. Your work softened the city defenses for the arrival of Karas's forces, but you wanted a decisive gesture that would give you your allies a meaningful advantage. How did you assist in the fall of the bastard city? Oh my, I have three options this time. Spread fear through assassination. Yes, that's right. Duel the city marshal. Abilities, warriors, respite. Cool. Stand your ground in the face of defeat. During this time you will regenerate health rapidly, but your damage is significantly reduced. This seems like more of a tanky ability, whereas Inside a riot will give me sharing palm. Gather heat and energy into your hands and release it in onto a foe. The target ignites in flames, burning over time. Spreading the word of Kairos, you converted the poor and disfected into a hidden army of the Scarlet Chorus. Once the dust settled, the army wished to bolster their two troops with these sleeper cells. And last but not least, concealing shadows which will create a cloud of obscuring shadows and dust. Cool, 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 cool. Ah, I think we will go with Inside the Riot. Honestly, this is very interesting, but I personally prefer to get the Searing Palm spell ability, rather. And getting an army to my lord and master Kairos is, well, a nice bonus to getting this cool ability. It didn't take much to convince the bastard cities downtrodden that Kairos was the superior power. You armed them with weapons and knowledge of a signal you would raise when the time was right. As the armies appeared outside the walls, you ignited the spark that fanned their anger into a full-scale riot. The chaos they spread in Kairos' name weakened the city to such an extent that its inevitable fall was but a formality. Oh, oh, oh. excellent, excellent first job. And the conquest uh, does not disappoint. This is really interesting. The bastard city settled into a new state of normalcy with every tower displaying Kairos' banner, which, by the way, is absolutely epic. Your name was whispered alongside rumors of a decorated career to come. The army is divided into two fronts and migrated south. Tunan sent word that you were to join the next frontier of Karis' conquest, either as judge and overseer of the settlement of Letian's Crossing or as a war advisor with the armies advancing into the realm of Apex. So I can go to Apex. The troops of the mountain realm of Apex stood idle in the safety of their valley bidding their time as their neighbors in the bastard tier fell. In the second year of, of war, a joint force of the disfavored in Scarlet Chorus crossed over the mountains to take control of the tier's central valley. Or rather, I can go to Lithian's Crossing. Deposits of iron made the settlement of Lithian's Crossing a strategic war asset. Kara sent the forge-bound smith mages of exceptional skill to establish a flow of weaponry. Tunan the adjudicator sent one of his fate binders to ensure the enforcement of Karas' law. Honestly, I see why I should go to Apex, but Lichin's Crossing is kind of the more interesting option. Let's just go with that, shall we? Year two of Karas' conquest. So we've done we went through the first year in a Fair amount of time, I'd say. Years ago, Lithian the Bold founded a small merchant town at the intersection of ancient old walls. A pact between the settlers and the mercenary company meant that caravans were able to travel without fear of bandits or bane, and the town thrived in modest insignificance. Oh, modest insignificance. 
that we all want to drive in that. Lutin's crossing drew Caris's attention for the iron deposits and the surrounding hills. With the region under Caris's control, the northern smith mages could set up workshop to refine ore and arm the disfavored with the finest weapons in the known world. The Archon of Secrets dismantled the mercenary support with a generous bribe. Oh, isn't that good old Archon just so nice? Taking the crossing in a bloodless victory. Clever. That was very clever. Tunan dispatched you to travel alongside Caris's forces and bring order to the region. Excellent. So we can either make sure that the Aran flows, or we can, I suspect, destroy a cult, the Archon of Songs, power, ensnared the mind of a disfavored soldier. This sounds interesting. Sirin, Arkan of Song, used her arcane charm to lure locals into joining Karas's army. As a patroness of the Scarlet Chorus, her efforts were critical to the conscription of new recruits. When an enthralled disfavored soldier joined her cult, his company feared that the Arkan was growing out of control and needed to be stopped. Destroy Sirin's cult, send Sirin's cult to the vanguard. I'm not going to destroy the cult, but I also want to see what the Aaron must flow is like. Karas' smith mages worked day and night to create weapons. No one faulted their dedication, yet production was low. Low. The plans that came to light proved divisive to the disfavored in Scarlet Chorus. On one hand, any additional manpower was needed for fighters, not forges. Yeah, the other thing is far more interesting, and I think I'm not going to destroy the cult of Sirin, rather I'm going to send her to the vanguard. In Scarlet Chorus tradition, you send the latest batch of cultists to the front lines of the Apex campaign. Those who survived were welcomed to remain in Karas's military, and their performance would stand as testimony to Siren's effectiveness. Siren. I love the name Siren. It shows... it rather hints to her powers. Especially if you are attentive when it comes to mythology. Sirens are, of course, known for their ability to... well, enthrall men's minds with their song. The Scarlet Chorus agreed to transfer Siren's latest recruits to the front lines of the Apex campaign. Your resolution fit their traditional model of conscription, so they considered it a fair alternative. In the weeks to come, more of them returned to active duty than even Siren herself expected, likely owing to their obsessive devotion to the Arkham and her enchanting music. As I said, singing music will get you through the day and through the war. A red anvil or ancient threats. Interesting. A forge-bound mage swore allegiance to the Scarlet Chorus, creating strife between the ar armies. I think I'm going to read ancient threats. Drawn to the arcane energy around the forges, mystical predators from the nearby old walls began to raid Letian's crossing at all hours. Oh my, that's unfortunate. Caris, both of Caris' armies reserved their strength for the front lines of the war, and yet the city required protection. You had to delegate the responsibility somewhere. Choose the Scarlet Chorus or the Disfavored. Since the Disfavored used most of the iron that came out of Lithian's crossing, it fell to them to stand as the city's vigilant protectors. The Scarlet Chorus enjoyed a necessary reprieve. As the largest army, you task the Scarlet Chorus with the burden of security. I'm going to go with the Scarlet Chorus, mainly because I just made sure that they would get the Sirens' Sirens' uh, reinforcements. At your command, the Scarlet Chorus flew to the streets of Lithian's Crossing. Infighting and competition among the unruly gangs made for disorganized patrols and distracted lookouts. However, when an ominous tide of old walls predators assaulted the city in previously unseen numbers, it took the full force of the Scarlet Chorus to repel the attack. See, wise. Who controlled the crossing? Uh oh. 
tragedy struck when a mercenary hired by the Voices of Nerat, the Voices of Nerat, known in his office, shall capacity as the Arcan of Secrets, the Voices of Nerat, yeah. Injured the forge bound a Tision. Oh my, that's, that's bad. Leaving him unable to practice his craft, Tunin ordered the mercenaries to leave the city in the hands of Karas' more responsive servants. Only a token garrison could be left behind while the armies returned to the front. The, the disfavored and scarlet chorus showed increasing tension and hostility towards each other. Tunin decreed it best that only one force controlled the crossing. Who controlled the crossing? He granted control of Lithium's crossing to the Scarlet Chorus. I'm going to go with the Disfavored. No, I'm going to go... Mm, this is a tricky one, and I'm sure it's going to come and bite me in the ass. I've done a lot of things about the Scarlet Chorus, and the Disfavored do get their metal from Lithium's crossing, so let's pick them. This favorite placed the Modus Garrison in the settlement, so the force was larger than might be needed to police the small settlement. Protecting the forgebound ironsmiths became the true agenda of the defense force, as these magical craftsmen kept the disfavored invasion force suited in iron. I knew this would be wise. Relieved of the departure of the chorus, the citizens felt they got the least of two burdens. You received word from Graven Ash thanking you for your decision. The forge bound and their weaponry could not be entrusted to the voices of Nerat. I feel that N the voices of Nerat is not going to like this particular choice of mine. Oh my, a lot of choices all of a sudden. Let's see. With the mercenaries expelled and Lithium's crossing under the new leadership, Karas's forces congratulated themselves on bringing order to the settlement and guaranteeing a productive flow of resources. Over the course of this div diversion, the army front advanced further into the tiers. Your skills were needed in the realm of Azure, Stalwart or the Vellum Citadel. The Vellum Citadel sounds pretty interesting. Karas's conquering gaze fell upon the Vellum Citadel, its treasures, its knowledge, its secrets. Okay, you had me at knowledge and secrets. Stalwart, on the other hand, has an easily defended position, rich military tradition, the realm of... yeah. The most formidable realm in the tiers. I'd rather leave it for later if I could, thank you very much. Or Azure. Karas dispatched the Arcan of Stone. Honestly, I just can't help myself. Knowledge, secrets, Vellum Citadel it is. Year 3 of Karas's Conquest. Can I just say how much I love this map? The way they have done the conquest system is absolutely fantastic. Let's see. The Vellum Citadel was an archive and library of a massive scale. Its inhib inhabitants were known as the School of Ink and Quill, a circle of mages that centuries ago carved out their own mountainous refugee, refuge on lands unsettled by the other major realms. Legends said that the citadel housed a treasure trove of arcane knowledge. The overlord spies infiltrated the school and confirmed as much. The, times, the time was ripe to send a detachment to the great library fortress and force the scholars to yield to Kairos! <laughs> Sorry, I can't help myself. Let's see. Song of Ensnarement. Sirens a song ensnared some stealthy sages. A peaceful surrender turned bloody. Oh, I see. Now, if I had wiped Siren, I bet that I would have gotten a different choice here. Right? Right? I know it. It's... I think it's... It should be that. Yeah. Well, chain of command. What is it about? Peaceful surrender turned bloody. A detachment of... No. No, 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 no. We are going to go all in with Siren. She is my favorite Arkan already. Siren, Arkan of Song, used her power to control enemy mages who crept beyond the citadel walls. After Karas's forces rounded 
up the arcane practitioners, the disfavored began executing the new captives before they could share dangerous knowledge. A crime under Carus's law with the Scarlet Chorus. Oh. Muzzle the mages, punish the disfavored. You calm the disfavored with a compromise. The sages' mouths would be bound with iron brittles, preventing them from speaking their forbidden knowledge. You punish the disfavored for executing mages bound to the Scarlet Chorus, ordering that several disfavored soldiers be given to the Arcan of Song as her personal bodyguards. Oh yes, I'm punishing the disfavored. Why? Because they... Well, they committed a crime under our Lord Caris's law. And I am nothing if not lawful evil. The wisdom of the sages and knowledge of the Velm Citadel were too important to silence. The disfavored balked at entering the Arkan service, but your ruling left them with no recourse. Arkan's siren delighted in having new toys to play with. Oh, she sounds absolutely tremendously amazing, and promptly enthralled her personal guard. You spotted them in come days later, following their new mistress with wide-eyed devotion. Just as one should. Fantastic! The spymaster's agents' suspicions arose when the sages surrendered. Or, right of command. Siren composed songs of strength and provoked bloody slaughter. Let's see this one. The Arcan of Song incited Scarlet Chorus recruits to fight their leaders. Bosses were killed and supplanted left and right. Oh my. Interesting. The disfavor demanded an end to the practice for the good of the conquest. Hmm. Honored right of challenge. You ruled the, that each Archon had the right to govern their armies according to their nature. The right of command bred chaos, but it does ensure that the strongest rise to lead. And this is also interesting. Hmm. Which one should I do? Yeah, I kind of want to go with this. Honor the right of challenge. I think it's important for our Archons to have a degree of autonomy in their decisions. Yes, because it is the only way to ensure that the strongest rise to lead. Did I sound like a politician or what? Mwahaha! <laughs> Your keen understanding of their ways pleased and surprised the Scarlet Chorus Detachment, who thanked you for the ruling. The following evening, two gang bosses were murdered in their pallets and replaced by stronger variants, who fought hard to defend their status. Though the camp grew quieter over time, the Chorus fought with twice the ferocity under new leadership. You see, you need to promote bloodletting in situations like this one. It's just the only way to make sure that you get capable, powerful people in this meritocracy that is Kairos's empire. Great, powerful rule. The Edict of Fire, disgusted by your probation of the Scarlet Chorus, the disfavored forces withdrew from the field of battle. Your small detachment now lacked the band power to take the Velm Citadel. Tunin sent word that Kairos's patience had run thin, the Overlord would cast an Edict of Fire on the enemy. Uh-oh. The parchment arrived in a slender case of engraved iron. Written on it, the words of a spell powerful enough to destroy the vellum. Citadel. You had the choice of one to read the Edict. Reading it at sunrise would offer your enemies no warning of the devastation to come. You could also wait until sunset, giving them ample time to flee or make amends. Claiming that they still had spies within the citadel, the Scarlet Chorus urged you to warn the mages of the Overlord's Edict. I feel like I didn't play this smart enough, by the way. Opting to give the enemy no quarter, you proclaimed the Edict of Fire the first moment of dawn, granting the enemy no warning of the destruction to come. 
To the chorus who insisted your actions doomed their despise, the disfavored applauded your decision. Interesting. Hmm. I'm going to give them a chance to run, and maybe, hopefully, they will decide to give me the city without I without the need of using the edict. Oh well. Numerous figures were spotted fleeing the citadel. As the sun dipped under the horizon, you read the words of the edict. The earth shook in red-orange light, glowing in the foundation of the sprawling citadel, bubbling up from under the library, a torrent of lava, headed with explosive force, gushing from windows and between loose bricks, melting, winding trenches in the surrounding land. Days later, the flame still raged on, the conflagration continually fed and renewed by the power of the edict. And that one was my bad. Sorry, guys. The armies of Kairos left the devastation of the Velum Citadel in silence. From that day forward, the tears came to know the once noble Citadel as the burning library. And I feel very guilty for burning all that knowledge, which, after all, I went, I went after. <laughs> this was an undisputed loss of resources, knowledge, culture, and life. But a message had been sent. The Overlord will not tolerate defiance. You didn't have long to rest before Tunan called you into service once more. You were one of the last to depart from mountains, and as your journey off, you spotted a few campfires in the mountains. They were specks dwarfed by the inferno, the last grabs, gasps of survivors, or perhaps looters from Kairos' armies, bored and daring enough to pick, showing, to pick through the remains of the first storm. Conquest complete. Excellent! Ah, this has been fun, right? A most interesting first chapter, if I should say so myself. The law skill can be used to impress characters in conversations with your knowledge or insight. The year is 431 and Kairos' invasion has shattered all major opposition in the Tears. The Younger Realms, the Bastard Tier, the Free Cities. All who defied Kairos lay broken by battle, or bowed in surrender. The two armies of the Overlord, the Disfavored and the Scarlet Chorus, now control our lands. Exciting enough, let's but continue. But our will is not yet extinguished. Not entirely. In the valley of Vendrian's well, Foolishly those of so. us unwilling to bow to Kairos have banded together in defiance. Violating an oath of surrender from two years prior, we have staged a bloody uprising, murdering the disfavored and Scarlet Chorus garrison in a midnight assault. Oh, that was a mistake. With their main forces spread across the tiers, the disfavored and scarlet chorus redeploy to Vendrian's well to crush the resistance, but months pass with no definitive battle. As disagreement and discord paralyze the Archons, we bide our time and wait for our message of insurrection to spread across the tiers. I'm going to make sure that it does not. The Overlord is not amused, and Kairos has one message for the Archons. Crush the Oathbreakers, uh -oh. or die. Uh -oh. backs this threat with an edict, a magical commandment that can slay all in the valley should the order be ignored. Whoa, he can do that? The honor of proclaiming this edict fell to you. Sent across the mountains to Vendrian's well, you carry the Overlord's edict to read before the Archons. Well... This, I'm probably not going to get a warm reception. As you finally make your way through the winding mountain passes into the valley, the ground trembles, and Kairos's magic seals the way behind you. Oh my. You are trapped in Vendrian's well, with Kairos's armies and the Oathbreakers. The only way to survive is to fulfill the terms of the Overlord's Edict. 
in any way that you can. Oh, so he sent me with the edict to tell all those Archons that I, well, I'm bringing them the worst news of all. And not only that, but he also trapped me with them. <laughs> Thank you so much, boss. God. Awesome person who can kill everyone in... Whoa! That is awesome. And creepy. I'd bind up Magnus, I presume. We've been expecting you. Oh my. Such a nice... I like the UI. I do. Characters. Most people you encounter in the world. No, actually, you know what? I think we're going to stop for today. Or rather for this episode. Because this has been one long process of character creation and conquest. And I'm going to wrap it up here. Thank you guys for watching. I really enjoyed doing this. And you will be able to see the second episode of my playthrough of Tyranny very, very soon. And it's time, finally, to get into the gameplay. See you next time. Bye.